There's a lot of excitement about this new drug for obesity treatment, semaglutide. Semaglutide. <laughs> a March 2021 study of semaglutide in the New England Journal of Medicine prompted people to call semaglutide an obesity game changer. Wow. That's like the equivalent of a wave, I think, for the medical community. So as a therapy to trigger weight loss, it's twice as effective as other drugs that came before it. And in the New England Journal study, the results, average weight loss of 15% at the end of 68 weeks for people who took a dose once a week. And about a third of the patients in this study lost 20% or more of their starting weight. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, those numbers are only previously only achievable through bariatric or other surgeries. I'm Chris Shulgin, executive producer of Eat, Move, Think. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm managing producer of Eat, Move, Think. And in today's episode, we are featuring MedCan's director of weight management, Dr. David Macklin, in conversation with our host, Sean Francis, MedCan's CEO. Dr. David Macklin is a lecturer at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Medicine and a University of Toronto trained family physician. He's also a science committee member of Obesity Canada. The two discuss the history of weight management therapies. They explore the implications of the drug semaglutide, its implications for weight management, its safety, and what else is coming down the pipe. Exciting. Let's roll that tape. Roll tape. Hi, I'm Sean Francis. I'm the CEO of MedCan, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Dave Macklin with me today, who is the head of the MedCan Weight Management Clinic and also one of North America's, maybe the world's foremost experts on obesity. I'm really glad to have you today, Dave, to talk about not just obesity, but some of the breakthrough drugs that are going to help people combat it in a way that we haven't had before. So anyhow, w welcome to the show. And Thanks, Sean. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Really, really glad to be here. Um, a little bit of background for everyone. I'm a, I'm a family doc. I'm the medical director, yeah, of the weight management program, which is really a national leading, very effective, ethical, evidence-based uh, treatment program for those who, who struggle with weight. I'm a co-author of our national guidelines. And so, yeah, this has been my work forever. Very excited to, to discuss what you'd uh, be interested in discussing today. So before, uh, Dave, we get to the topic of drugs, and in particular, semaglutide, which is a breakthrough drug for obesity. Let's back up and talk to our listeners about the, you know, the problem of obesity. How do we get here where I, I want to say the majority of people, or certainly the majority of people are overweight in North America with maybe as much as a third who are obese. Yeah, about a third. There's been a collision between a, a brain that was built for a time when calories were scarce, which has collided with a, a modern food environment. One of the earliest stages of uh, obesity management, weight management for those overweight or struggling with weight is to address, and we kind of come forward first in this, in our guidelines. It's kind of the lead of, our, of the Canadian national guidelines, which is, a, which is a, an absolute kind of world leading guidelines on the, the recognition and treatment of, the, uh, of adults living with obesity. But our lead is to invite people to consider that struggling with weight is a real medical condition. And this is not common thinking. It's not necessarily intuitive. How we arrived here, many would be surprised to learn that about 70% of someone's risk of struggling with weight in their lifetime is, is conferred genetically. And also many are surprised to learn that the absolute majority of those genes are in the central nervous system. We consider this a brain condition. It's a progressive condition. There are processes that make struggling with weight more difficult over time. It's extremely strongly environmentally influenced. Uh, and the brain defends against fat loss. As people lose weight, the brain will defend against this. And so this brain built for a time when calories were scarce um, collides with our modern food environment. And that's really as the modern, let's call it obesogenic food environment, kind of crawls across the earth, we see obesity rates following. And then you see countries with genetic vulnerabilities uh, that are clearly higher with higher obesity rates. So real condition, and the point in discussing that is to see if someone would consider therefore that if they're living with obesity, would they consider then that it's not their fault? Such common messaging that eventually gets internalized by someone struggling with their weight is that so much their fault or they're not trying hard enough, they don't have the willpower, not strong, they're just, you know, uh, they're not dieting or finding the right diet or working out enough. And then finally, which I think is one of our points today, is not only is it a real condition and not someone's fault, but treatment exists. So we're in a super exciting stage in my field of medicine. I've been here for 18 years, 
But I can safely say that 2022, for a number of reasons, will be characterized in history as the first time that we have a, a very effective non-surgical treatment for this real medical condition. What does obesity cost us as a society? So uh, I feel a great honor to be leading a field of medicine where really what we're looking to manage is considered to be the leading preventable cause of death and disability on our planet. Certainly we know that excess adiposity, so carrying extra fat in our body, leads to a, a number of complications. First, metabolically. So, you know, we, we, we all know conditions like type 2 diabetes or hypertension or uh, high cholesterol or fatty liver or osteoarthritis of the knees or sleep apnea uh, or something called PCOS. So these are all conditions that are incredibly or powerfully impacted by someone's weight, by how much uh, fat they carry in their body. In fact, our definition of obesity is not uh, size. We don't use uh, BMI. We don't use waist circumference. We define obesity as excess adiposity. Again, that's a word for fat. Excess adiposity that affects someone's health and, and their quality of life. And so, you know, as the leading preventable cause of death and disability on the planet, the cost is significant. But uh, aside from financial costs, we really you know, in the MedCan clinic, we, we really talk about the cost to an individual. And everyone uh, experiences overweight differently. And so uh, in a very personalized way, we're able to discover through treatment how someone is being affected, what is the cost to them in their health and their quality of life. And that's when we kind of are very happy to share uh, with individuals that, you know, now, thankfully, effective treatment exists. More than perhaps any other field of wellness, weight loss has been inundated with cures that are not evidence-based. We've seen everything from slimming spray to vintage vibrating exercise belts, dozens of different magic fat-burning pills. Cigarette smoking was even marketed as a way to lose weight. So for some context here, can we start by talking about a history of the weight loss therapies and why are we so fixated on the so-called weight loss pill? Why all of these, as you mentioned, kind of slimming sprays or uh, exercise belts uh, exists is I, I like to frame this as kind of we, we own this as physicians because we have not been forthcoming with effective treatment and support for those who live with obesity or the risk of obesity. And so it just makes perfect sense that there would develop a market that would capitalize or uh, maybe that's the best way to put it, or act in a predatory way, maybe that's the worst way to put it, on uh, individuals who are struggling with their weight by providing solutions that don't help them. Individuals will look for solutions and then struggle. Of course, they're struggling not because they didn't find the right solution, they're struggling because they're living with a real condition that's untreated, and now for which treatment exists. So, of course, people would look for things from magic pills to creams to whatever might help. I mean, primarily, really, the off-track direction that's most common as far as a recommendation to individuals living with obesity is really diets. And uh, what many people don't know is that there is absolutely no best diet for weight loss. So, for example, you know, all the low-carb concepts of ketogenic dieting are all based on a principle called the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis that somehow weight is caused by the foods we eat and spikes of insulin and storage of fat and increases in appetite and drops in metabolic rate. And that's all well discredited now. It's very safe to say there is no best diet, but as far as stuff that's pushed to people, as far as a solution, I think diet is uh, extremely common uh, as a recommended solution. And yet we can confidently say that there is no best diet for weight loss. In fact, in all the clinical trials where they pit one diet against another one, we always see in the, in the summary, in the, in the conclusion rather of the paper, it always says the individual's success in both losing weight, the subject's success in losing weight and in health outcomes was not predicted by which diet they were randomized to, but their level of adherence to whichever diet they were randomized to, which really talks about making changes in our eating and our activity that are sustained. And adherence is actually the key. And that's what determines when someone does well. That's why behavioral therapy is often combined with the, the possibility of medication as well. And the foundation of obesity management is behavioral therapy to really promote that adherence. And so we own that. We haven't been coming forward with effective treatment, but that's all changing now. Before semaglutide and the GLP-1 receptor agonist came along, what was there out there? So the, the foundation of treatment, this comes out clearly in our guidelines, the foundation of treatment of obesity for obesity, for those living with obesity is behavioral therapy, uh, one, two, medications, and three, surgery. 
Um, you might think diet and exercise, but it's interesting that it's changes in how people eat and their activity levels that are an outcome of treatment. That's not the treatment. It's not changing one's eating and their activity levels that is the treatment. That's the outcome. If successfully treating someone, then they end up, yes, overall eating less and potentially more active. And so what has preceded the most, uh, the modern kind of advancements in, in medication were previous medications that were simply less effective. Going back a long time, there were medications that were effective, but not safe. Then there were medications that were safe, but not really that effective. And so, of course, when you put both together, that's a distinct advantage. And that's where we are now. So fortunately, we have for the first time, and this will be a very commonly understood phenomena as the years transpire, people will not blink at the idea that someone is managing their weight with the help of uh, one of the modern medications that we have now for supporting obesity. So David, when you first began hearing about semaglutide and the GLP-1 receptor agonist, were you skeptical about their benefits? And what prompted you to sit up and take notice? Sure. So let me kind of provide some background for everyone. When we eat, uh, you may not know this, but a hormone will get released from your gut called the GLP-1. You make it yourself. And it's about one of, uh, say, half a dozen of what we call uh, satiety hormones or gut hormones. And when it gets released, amongst other things, it will travel to your, your brain, the base of your brain, and it'll create a signal of I've had enough. That's what the GLP-1 molecule that you make yourself does. It's one of the things it does. The medication semaglutide is simply an analog, a replication of this natural hormone that we all make. In fact, semaglutide is about 94% identical to the hormone that we make ourselves. In fact, the 6% difference is just so that it lasts a week and it can be a once weekly medication because the GLP-1 that we make ourselves gets broken down every two minutes and you can't really give someone medication every two minutes. And so that's kind of the concept or the, the nature of the GLP-1 class of medications. The mechanism of action and what it does for us and how effective it is, uh, those are all kind of new concepts that, yes, took my interest a long time ago. And I've certainly been at the forefront of both prescribing but understanding the, the mechanisms and the efficacy and the safety of the GLP-1 class of medications. And, and now we're at, fortunately, at this very exciting stage where individuals struggling with their weight will have an, an option. Not everyone's say, interested in medication. And behavioral changes are really at the foundation and behavioral support, which we excel at at MedCan, is really the foundation of supporting someone who struggles with their weight. But fortunately, we can safely say that individuals who uh, might be interested will find that there is effective and safe medication that goes a long way to supporting their capacity to both lose weight and in a sustainable way, keep it off. What do you think is so interesting about semaglutide? It's been called a game changer. You agree with this? And if so, why? Sure. So why is there even a field of uh, anti-obesity medications? What do anti-obesity medications really do? And this goes back to something I was mentioning earlier. Remember I said that fat loss is defended against? Right, here's the idea. And it's not intuitive to everyone, and maybe not everyone knows this, but our brains are expert at recognizing fat loss. Fat cells make this hormone called leptin, and whatever the highest level we reach in our weight, our brains bookmark that as the right weight that we should stay at, sad but true. And that level of leptin, that much fat, is what we should stay at. And so the brain recognizes a drop in leptin. That's the mechanism. And when weight loss is recognized and fat loss is recognized by our brain, our brain will defend against that. If our ancestors lost weight, it wasn't to look good for a wedding or because bathing suit season was coming. It was because the food supply was interrupted. And, and so what the brain will do is it will combat weight loss by really only two things, increase our appetite and to decrease our metabolic rate. And the most common or the most substantial is that there'll be an increase in appetite to weight loss. So what do anti-obesity medications do? What does semaglutide do? It really can be thought of as the medication defends us against the natural defense that the brain will go through by increasing appetite to try to defend us against weight loss. Anyone listening who's tried to lose weight will recognize that as you lost weight, things became more and more difficult. Weight loss slowed and slowed and pulled in somewhere. And if anything, hunger or wanting or desire or drive to calories was stronger. That wasn't your fault. Regaining weight isn't uh, something for shame or blame. It's actually biology. And so the role of medications is defend against that. And what's so important about semaglutide is just the degree of its effectiveness. So we have not seen medications that can be supported with behavioral therapy 
where someone will be losing 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 percent of their body weight and keeping it off. Picture a 250 pound guy, right, who's, uh, you know, his blood sugars are mildly elevated and he has high blood pressure and maybe high cholesterol, just as an example. And so a 20 percent body weight loss means that this guy gets to hang out at 200 for the next 30 years of his life instead of the progressive 250, which can even become more because obesity is a progressive disease. So that we've never seen. We've never seen numbers like that. That's why it's called a game changer. We've never seen that kind of efficacy. You know, uh, it's extremely common that patients will lose uh, in the MedCan clinic, a weight management program, 20% uh, of their total body weight and be in a remarkable position to keep that off. And so that's the game change is not that medications are effective and safe, but the degree to the effectiveness of this medication. Those are real numbers and quality of life changes at those numbers and health changes. Medical conditions resolve or regress. Blood sugars become normal. Diabetes resolves. High blood pressure disappears. People come off medications. Cholesterol gets significantly lowered. Fatty liver regresses or resolves. Sleep apnea either goes away or becomes significantly reduced. And those are all real impacts to a patient. So to be able to support someone with this condition that otherwise uh, is very difficult to manage, that's the game change. How does this work over time? Do people gain the weight back if they go off the drug? Yeah, it's such a good question, right? So, okay, you know, how long do I need to... <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Macklin. Sounds good. How long do I need to stay on this medication? <laughs> it's actually a common question for patients early in our program, but not later in our program. Why? Because by the time someone's in our program for some duration, they understand that living with obesity is a chronic disease. Why? Because we talk about that all the time. We talked about today just the reasons, one of the key reasons why this is considered a chronic condition. Wait, you're saying the highest weight that I get to is bookmarked by my brain, and as I start to lose weight, it pushes me back? When does it give up trying to get me back up? Certainly once I've lost a certain amount of weight and years have gone by, my brain's going to give up getting me back up. I'm healthier. Wouldn't my brain want me to be healthier? Sorry for the bad news. But we have no evidence that the brain gives up trying to return you to your highest weight. We call that highest weight a set point. And so because this is a chronic disease, we talk to patients and say, listen, this is a 30, 40, 50 year project that you're starting if you're looking to manage weight long term. And so for any chronic disease, medication use is also long term and chronic. No one would be surprised if someone with significant family history of high blood pressure who's now finally effectively managing their blood pressure with medication, this is a conversation that never happens. The, the patient comes back and says, doc, the weirdest thing, that blood pressure medication, remember you put me on it and made my blood pressure normal? Yeah. Well, the weirdest thing happened. I stopped taking the blood pressure medication and my blood pressure went back up. So weird, right? That would never happen because everyone in that scenario understands that this is a chronic condition and chronic conditions deserve and are effectively treated by chronic treatment. And so most certainly I invite people to understand that the logic of uh, semaglutide is long-term use. Having, having said that, it's actually a really easy medication to come off of. So people can come off of it. And some people do at lower weights. They're kind of like, what's my life with? What's my life without? They come off or significantly lower their dose and then make the call themselves. As far as medication use, the, the real model in medicine is this is your life. This is your path. This is your choice. We are guides as physicians. We don't tell people what to do. That's, that's the kind of modern model of medicine. I have to tell you, though, in my experience, uh, and I have a significant level of experience with semaglutide use in, in obesity management, maybe, maybe the most in, in Canada, at least. Yeah, most people will go back on because think about it. You're down by 20% of your body weight and your brain it, you come off the medication, your brain recognizes this weight loss that had been kind of in a way hidden to the brain because semaglutide was supporting a reduction in appetite. I mean, let's go back to that guy. He was 250. Now he's 200. And he comes off the medication. He's going to be subject to whatever his brain would have been when he lost 50 pounds. And primarily that's more appetite. So more wanting. Now, of course, those people, when they're doing things on their own, regain the weight and blame themselves. But it's biology. That's the brain doing its thing. And so, yes, long-term use for a chronic condition. That's the idea. And when you say brain doing its thing, you mean it's unavoidable that you're going to feel like eating more. Yeah. When you're down by that significant percentage. Now, it's a genetically variable trait. Remember, I didn't mention this, but the majority of the genes in obesity are in the brain. Um, and there's about 1,500 of them, maybe, bro broadly. We're learning that from genome-wide association studies. And so it's incredibly variable. So one person's, you know, these are the heroes that put, get put on billboards for advertisements and weight loss from a diet. Somehow they have the genetic vulnerability 
to gain weight, but not an obstacle to losing it. Their brain didn't fight back that much. Of course, they get to be a hero and put on a poster. And yet we know that genetically, uh, listen, I don't mean to diminish someone's weight loss, but it's extremely, uh, as a variable trait, some people's brains fight back much strongly, uh, much more strongly. That's actually why we never talk about target weights or goal weights or ideal weights. It's kind of this interesting concept, right? So in our field of medicine, we've thrown out target, uh, how much weight should I lose, doc? Or uh, my, my orthopedic surgeon told me I should lose 50 pounds. We never talk about target weights or goal weights or ideal weights uh, or pounds per week, why? Because we don't have control over that. We have control over our behaviors. When we're putting together our most modest lifestyle that's enjoyable and sustainable and livable and something we could really do long-term, which is the advice, um, exactly where your brain kind of lets you land is variable. Some people lose more, some people lose less. And one of the key reasons is because the brain fights back variably. Some people experience a significant rise in appetite and decrease metabolic rate in response to fat loss. Some people's brains don't mind. God bless them. It's just different. And so to compare yourself and your path and weight management to someone else makes absolutely no sense whatsoever when we're talking about such a what, what is called a polygenic condition, 1,500 different genes that all in small ways contribute to someone's risk of struggling with weight or regaining weight after losing. So here's a challenge, David. Can you explain as though you're talking to a five-year-old how semaglutide and the GLP-1 receptor agonists work and why they're so effective? I like that question. So here's a concept. I trip up a lot of obesity experts when I ask this question. So the question I ask is, when we're treating asthma, we're treating the symptoms of wheezing and cough, coughing and shortness of breath. When we treat osteoarthritis, we're treating joint swelling and, and joint pain and disability. So if we're considering treating someone who's with, living with obesity, what's the symptom that we're treating? Not intuitive to everyone. So what drives overeating? What drives the risk of having difficulty losing weight is a little bit of a neurology digression, if you bear with me. Remember, we talked about our brains being built for a time when calories were scarce. What that means is work was required to get food. And we had to be constantly motivated internally, subconsciously, to think about and be driven and motivated to get food. Picture that and then collide that brain with our modern food environment. So what is that motivation, that drive, that desire, that subconscious instinct to food? It goes by many names, but classically it's called in the literature wanting. On the street, I think it's most commonly called cravings, desire, urge, impulse, uh, attention, bias. These are all the same names. So that's what semaglutide manages. It diminishes the motivation and drive towards food specifically and alcohol, interestingly enough. That's kind of a little bit of a side discussion. People will understand this. It's actually a Pavlovian story. When does the listener who might be struggling with their weight, when do they experience wanting? It's actually very patterned. It's a fascinating exercise to go through with someone. You ask them, kind of where in your day might you have um, kind of your highest risk on average of over-consuming or taking in more calories? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had you know, three new patients today, and two out of the three said immediately, it's the time between dinner and sleep if I think about it. You know, I'll get home and have dinner, and then, you know, once the kids have gone to bed and I'm, you know, watching TV and relaxing with my spouse, or the other one said without my spouse, I kind of have this drive. And they know they're not physically hungry. They had dinner. So what is motivating and driving them to calories at that point? Well, it's we call it wanting or desire, or, and it happens through associative learning. So what that means is that we know that that patient will, and if you ask, how many times has couch TV end of day been paired with tasty food? And often the answer is thousands. And if you think of Pavlov's story, that's how wanting gets generated. A learning takes place through associations of tasty food repeatedly associated with certain settings. It's Pavlov's story. He had a bell. But here, the couch TV end of day has been paired enough times with abundant or tasty calories, energy dense calories, which our brains treasure. And it's resulted in a learning such that the setting itself now drives wanting. So what does the medication do? Remember, you know that thing I would say to the young person, you know that thing, that moment, that time where you're at risk of uh, having difficulty self-regulating over this kind of motivation and drive and it's on your mind and you're thinking about food and you might take in more than you need? That's what the medication does. It dampens that thing. It takes it from a nine to a one out of 10. And so people will uh, say, you know what, there I was and actually it, it I thought for a second about food, but I actually just really wasn't interested. It's not someone will say I was full. I wanted to eat and I was full. That's a fullness thing. That's not what we're talking about. It's not what the medication does. Or it's not the major role of the medication. The medication will make that person just less interested. 
I'm good. I don't really need anything. They'll brush their teeth and say, that's weird. I didn't even think about food. It doesn't come to their mind. The motivational drive, which is at the center, it's the main symptom of those who struggle with weight, gets significantly dampened. So there's more room to stop and pause and think and say things like, I'm good. I'm actually going to maybe, you know, just go to bed or do something else. And uh, that results in less calorie intake and less calorie intake results in weight loss. And the medication fights against the brain's defense. And then that person is in a position to be able to lose weight and keep it off well, in a way that we've not, not seen ever in our field. So that's really what makes this an exciting time. So David, what are the drawbacks of semaglutide and the drugs in its class? Right. That's a, that's a great question, right? So commonly a question which we as clinicians need to cover with all medications that we invite patients to consider using. Fortunately, the class of the GLP-1 analogs have been around for 20 years. There's about 15 years of clinical medicine. There's a number of diabetes medications on the market that are GLP-1. There's a, a weight loss medication that's on the market. Ozempic, which is the other name for uh, semaglutide, is on the market actually now as a diabetes medication. It'll be soon on the market as a weight management medication, probably in the fall in Canada under the name Wagovi, that'll also be semaglutide. And so fortunately we have kind of all this data. And by the way, when you, if you wanna be a diabetes or a weight management medication in the United States um, or, or Canada, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. So the FDA has been very close and watching and looking for a really stringent level of safety analysis of these medications. So it, it helps us docs sleep better at night knowing that there's been both a, a high level of investi investigation of the safety of this class of medications and also that it's come out quite well. So for example, there are no cancer risks associated with this medication whatsoever. I bring that up because once there was a discussion around a very rare thyroid cancer, bad news for mice, which they may be at risk of when taking a GLP-1 analog, but in, we've not seen a, a single signal of uh, either thyroid cancer risk in humans. In fact, the, the experts in this field would kind of wish that that wasn't in the monograph where they talk about the risk in mice of this rare thyroid cancer. It kind of spooks people and, and we don't see it. Not only do we not see cancer risks with this medication, but in fact, what we do see that if someone loses 15, 20 or more percent of their body weight, there's a dramatic reduction in the risk of cancer almost across the board. And so the FDA says, because of really good science, uh, clinical trials called Sustain6 and the LEADER trial, it says that they have every reason to believe, and they'll actually uh, allow a claim that just being on these medications, if you're at risk of heart disease and you have diabetes, just being on the class of GLP-1 means that you will experience a reduction in your risk of heart disease and a reduction in your risk of stroke. And that those changes are independent of weight loss and they're independent of how the medication's helping with your blood sugar. So there's something else going on. That's kind of really cool. And by the way, and I know this is really close to you, Sean, but also the semaglutide, interestingly enough, is in a phase three trial right now because it's been shown to be quite effective in reducing the progression of dementia in those who are living with uh, varied dementia disorders. So there's something about keeping vessels open, whether in the heart or in the brain, that this medication does. It's kind of really, and stay tuned on that. We're gonna learn much more about that. And so for that reason, we kind of have this really interesting and positive kind of safety realm to the GLP-1 class of medications. Keep in mind also, it's a, it's, in a way, it's a natural hormone. It's not really a medication. It's 94% identical to something you make yourself. The most common side effects are mild nausea and mild heartburn. It's a once weekly medication. So if you have side effects, it's most likely around the day that you take it, kind of in the week. And the medication's side effects become less and less over time. It's something about us getting used to a higher level of GLP-1 in our body that results in, a, over time, a reduction in, in side effects. And it's very rare later on in using this medication that side effects are persistent. Maybe in 5% of people will see a, a persistent mild nausea with the use of medication, but most people will say, yeah, the effect is there. It's supporting my appetite, diminishing my wanting, my desire, my drive at the couch while watching TV, uh, but side effects are pretty well gone. Yeah, safety and, and tolerability, uh, that's another word for side effects in a way. That's something which we review with all patients for sure. Do you have any clinical experience with semaglutide and how is it changing lives today among your patients? Yes, I've been experiencing with my team, a team of registered dietitians and another fantastic physician named Sandy Ban. We've been managing patients with semaglutide for, uh, actually since it's been kind of on the market as a diabetes medication. We've been using it off label. It's interesting, right? It's not on the market yet as a weight loss medication. It will be in the fall under the name Wigovi, but in, doctors are comfortable when they're experts in, in, in the specific field or a specific use of the medication. And so I, I, it's, I think it's fair to consider myself 
kind of an expert in the use of the medication clinically and, and the outcomes are yeah they are quite remarkable again we're seeing you know 18 19 20 21 22 percent mean weight loss lost and kept off this is an injection though yeah it's a once weekly injectable that's a great point i didn't mention so sometimes people hear what do you mean that's an injectable and people say well that's kind of weird so yes it's a simple pen that kind of sits in your fridge you uh, in this case with some aglutide um it, you simply kind of there's a disposable tiny needle you can barely see with your eye and it touches to your skin and you hold a button down for a you know a couple of seconds and throw it back in the fridge really easy to use what's fascinating is when i started using glp1 analogs i always thought patients would have difficulty with that what's fascinating is i and this sounds like a exaggeration i actually have not found maybe more than a handful of patients in nine years that have said boo and you can do it yourself i mean the patient themselves yeah, can administer yeah, it do it themselves this yeah you just touch it to like around your abdomen or a leg disposable tiny little needle that goes onto it and uh yeah people do it at home the way people describe it is that uh there's not only no discomfort but you most people say they don't even really feel anything and why is it an injectable versus a pill will that change yeah, excellent question, right? So <laughs> it will change because doctors are reticent to, to write prescriptions for injectables, even though patients don't mind them. So if doctors are going to write prescriptions, the, the companies that make the medication are like, oh, we got to make a pill. And so they have. There's been incredible advancements. So first of all, why is it a, an injectable? So proteins are like a, like a house of cards, and they will denature pretty quickly, and they'll lose their function. When they're put into pill form, they go into the stomach and they pass the liver and it's very hard to keep the protein in shape. There is an oral version of semaglutide. It's called ribelsis. It's on the market now and it's an effective diabetes medication and it's not quite at the level of dosage that's effective for weight management, but they're working on it. It's kind of a little more inconvenient though. I don't know. What would you do, right? Listeners, what would you do? So take a pill that you actually have to take aside from food and water. You have to kind of take it aside from any of that every day, and then you have to wait a little while before you can eat or drink, or just a once weekly really easy in injection uh, that just, um, yeah, that most people tolerate really well. But yes, it'll go in both directions. Um, what's interesting about this class of medications actually is that my patients won't necessarily be on semaglutide even as, as soon as two years from now, because there's another medication called trisepatide, which is a dual agonist. They copied two of these appetite hormones and bound them together and it affects it looks like it might be even more effective in weight management and then not to be left out probably five years from now i'm completely guessing it looks like they'll have kind of the next medication which will be a combination of semaglutide with something called amylin another one of these hormones so uh, and it'll be even more effective in fact the early studies with this next generation weight management medication this is the pipeline this is why we're so excited shows twice the effectiveness as semaglutide. So we're now going to be approaching the numbers that people will see in a sustainable way that they see with gastric bypass surgery. Listen, I love my gastric bypass surgeon and, and gastric sleeve surgeon friends, but we might be putting them out of business at some point because the numbers that we're seeing are kind of surgery-like. And that's really why you know, great endocrinologist, Daniel Drucker, I ran into him in a parking lot and he said, you know, I'm sending all my new endocrinologist residents to the field of obesity if they'll go, because I think it's the most exciting field in medicine right now is obesity management. And partly because of this pipeline and the, the effective treatments that we'll have for, again, the leading preventable cause of death and disability and people who have been, if anything, stigmatized and discriminated against and told that they're just not trying hard enough. And of course, they're living with a real condition that is not their fault. And now we're able to say very effective treatment exists for it. So super exciting field of medicine, a very positive professional experience for us uh, to be able to help people as we are. And, and, and the future looks even brighter. How does semaglutide, you just touched on it, how does it compare to the gastric bypass surgery? Yeah, so you know, one of the ways to measure outcomes in weight management treatment is mean weight loss. Right, so the average weight loss that someone will see at one year and two years and three years. And there is certainly currently no more effective and safe treatment than gastric bypass surgery and another surgery called the gastric sleeve. Whereas we talk about say 18 or 19 or 20% mean weight loss with a medication like semaglutide, we look at 35 or even more percent total body weight loss in surgery. And so certainly we can safely say that surgery is currently the most effective uh, and safe treatment uh, for this real medical condition. 
but yeah, my point was, uh, I think that we actually won't be seeing that for long. So gastric bypass is 40%. Yeah. What's interesting about gastric bypass surgery is we actually see, listen, it's a chronic condition. So we actually do see, it's not uncommon that people will see regain at some point post-surgery. And what is happening now, we see really interesting data about the augmentation of treatment when people are have had surgery, are regaining weight, the augmentation of uh, a GLP-1 analog. And so we're seeing now adjunct to people who've had surgery and putting them on medication to help support the later years of their treatment. And by the way, why does appetite go down in gastric bypass surgery? The appetite effect in gastric bypass surgery is actually a rise in a gut hormone called GLP-1. If people are doing really well in gastric bypass, after gastric bypass surgery, one of the key reasons is because their own endogenous, the GLP-1 stuff they make themselves, actually went up very high. So the very molecule we've been talking about today is the molecule complicit in the appetite reduction and weight loss in gastric bypass surgery. That's the funny and fantastic world of gut hormones. That's fascinating, David. Thank you very much. It's uh, an exciting development in this field and really uh, positive for people that struggle with obesity and hopefully good for society as well. And Sean, just on a personal note, MedCan is really at the, at the forefront of effectively treating those who, who live with obesity. Uh, and the program here is considered a national leading program. So, you know, kudos to you as well. Thank you, David. And thanks for joining me on Eat, Move, Think podcast. That was our host and MedCan CEO, Sean Francis, in conversation with MedCan's Director of Weight Management, Dr. David Macklin. If you're interested in arranging a consultation with Dr. Macklin or the MedCan weight management team, check out the MedCan website at medcan.com, call 416-350-5900, or email weight at medcan.com. That's W-E-I-G-H-T at medcan.com. Remember to rate and subscribe to Eat, Move, Think on your favorite podcast platform. Follow our host, Sean Francis, on Twitter and Instagram at Sean C. Francis. That's Sean with a U and Dr. David Macklin on Twitter at David Macklin, MD. Lastly, follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell. We'll post episode highlights and links you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat, Move, Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. Senior producer is Russell Gregg. I'm Jasmine Ratch, managing producer. Social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gertan and Andrew Imax. I'm executive producer Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back soon with a new episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with the specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan. Are not endorsed by MedCan.